OK, so um, thank you, everyone, for coming on this uh, stormy Thursday afternoon. I um, very appreciate that. Um, and today, my talk will be about your own personal computer or supercomputer in 15 minutes or less. So just to give a little background, you know, I always like to do a bit of an introduction slide, you know, talk about my background, you know, explain kind of what I do specifically. Um, but I am a high performance um, computing engineer that works at Canonical. Um, so if you're not familiar with what that organization is, it is the, uh, I like to say it, um, primary sponsor of the Ubuntu um, Linux distribution. So we hire a lot of developers that all kind of work on this distribution, as I like to say, a downstream opinion of Debian. Um, and kind of my contribution to that, um, I like to, I'm very involved with the community. Um, so I am an Ubuntu member, which is basically means I'm a recognized person by our community as a um, frequent contributor. Um, I also chair our uh, yearly summits that we have, usually in like Western Europe. You know, we bring everybody from all around the world to, you know, just basically talk about Ubuntu and open source and all that. Um, and then I also like to organize local events, you know, show up at booths like this event today. Um, I'm also into snaps and this is other thing, um, not so ancient elder of Ubuntu HPC. So now I would like to preface you with a question. Why would you want your own personal supercomputer in 15 minutes or less? And so, you know, it's always very interesting because one thing I find when I talk with other HPC professionals is that a lot of them are like, oh, well, you know, it's all this like really fancy high end hardware, you know, high speed networking, you know, high performance storage, you know, you have some workload scheduler in there and, you know, you don't want to necessarily boil it down into a small system that you deploy in 15 minutes. You know, it can frequently take, you know, over six months to just get a new system up and running. So why would exactly would you want one in 15 minutes? Well, I'll preface it with a bit of a story here. And so one thing, I think even looking at like the agenda of this event and what's been going on around the tech industry is kind of the rise of AI or maybe looking at some of the market details or to see the fall or a bit of the bubble popping. Um, but the idea is that a lot of people are now really starting to look into, you know, how can they, you know, take AI, how can they work with it, how can they do something with it? Um, and it's very interesting. And so one thing that I did want to kind of talk about was like an interesting thread that I saw on HBC Social, um, which is basically a Mastodon instance. If you're you know familiar with kind of the Fediverse and all that, um, essentially it's like an instance of Mastodon that's more targeted towards HPC professionals. And what we were focusing on, or you know, there was kind of a discussion that was happening, was about NVIDIA GTC. So that was an event that happened earlier this year. Um, I think it's GPU um, Technology Conference, um, but the idea of the conference was like, oh, it's all about GPUs and the products that NVIDIA is working on. And like kind of the very omnipresent theme was like AI, you know, what can we do with AI? You know, everybody buying hardware to train AI. It's where they announced Blackwell, you know, companies already purchased placing orders. And then you can kind of also look here and see, you know, some examples of news articles from the recent year um, about how a lot of companies are really starting to invest in actually building these HPC clusters or AI clusters. And so the funny thing was, was that, you know, there were a lot of HPC professionals that went there. You know, GPUs are actually used um, quite often um, in HPC workloads, you know, for performing a lot of, you know, intensive calculations. And what someone had suggested was the idea that, oh, NVIDIA GTC should be split into two events. You know, it's way too focused on AI. So instead, you know, it should be split into two. Um, one that's focused on HPC and the other that's focused on AI. Obviously, um, there was a lot of discussion about that. You know, folks were kind of going back and forth, the opinions of that. But there was one response that really stuck out to me, which was, if they were separate events, AI would be in the conference center and HPC would be in the parking lot, which obviously, um, that was very difficult to hear, you know, as an HPC professional, um, basically being told like, oh yeah, you know, the stuff you work on, it's not interesting anymore, nobody cares. And so obviously when I read that line, my reaction was that. You know, it's like, is it still actually worth being an HPC engineer? You know, because it's like, oh, we want AI engineer. You know, we want people to do AI. And it's like, oh, well, I do HPC. And it's like, oh, so you like clean the cobwebs off the university system. Um, and so obviously, it was very difficult for me. But I asked myself, perhaps not all is lost. So one thing that I always like to talk about and kind of an argument that sometimes I wouldn't necessarily say an argument, but a discussion that I often get into, like the AI professionals, folks who have really kind of jumped on the AI train and what they're focusing on um, is kind of looking at like, oh, where's the overlap? You know, HPC and AI are different. How are they, you know, similar? Or, you know, oh, they're completely two different things. You know, HPC is very focused on, you know, this specific problem domain, while AI is focused on a completely different product domain. 
But you know what I like to say, kind of where the overlap actually is, is where it's you know using a distributed cluster of advanced resources to process data, you know, at scale. And so, kind of further looking at like the overlap between the two industries is now um, seeing what common needs do they share. And so, for example, you know, in AI with like these giant AI clusters that are often built on top of Kubernetes and you know HPC systems, which are more kind of built traditionally with like bare metals or virtual machines. Um, is that they kind of have these key categories that they all need to have. There's other overlap, but these were the you know big categories that I kind of take away, which is like resource allocation and scheduling. So for example, when you look at that, um, you could basically say like, oh, you have an entire team of scientists and researchers who are trying to train a model. In HPC's case, you might have like say like, oh, you know, we're trying to analyze this data set that we've collected over 10 years. And the idea is that like, oh, you have a whole bunch of people trying to use the same resources. So you need some way of actually intelligently scheduling their access to it. So they don't actually end up being noisy neighbors and conflicting with each other. Next thing is task and job management. So obviously, if you have a giant you know, $300 million cluster, you're not going to be the only person using it. So you need to have some kind of way of actually properly managing the jobs that are running on the system. You also have identity and access management. So you want to make sure that the people who are actually logging into your system and running workloads on, to, on it are actually who they say they are. Um, you have orchestration. So like AI systems, HPC systems also are composed of a multitude of services that actually kind of provide the core functionality of the cluster. So you need to have some way of actually ensuring that everything's in a good state and they're able to configure. Um, you need high-speed networking because usually you're exchanging terabytes of data at a time. So you want to make sure that you can throughput it, um, it successfully. Um, they also leverage distributed and parallel storage. So distributed, it's like you have your data kind of going through one central server and being stored in a bunch of different locations while Parallel storage, you have your data you know, being striped across lots of systems. You need distributed hardware and accelerators, so you'll have dedicated you know, GPUs or FPGAs um, or something like that. Um, but basically, you're not just running everything on one single system and instead spreading across many. And then you know, kind of the last category that I really like to mention is observability. And so with that, you know, what observability is is effectively, OK, you have this giant system that you spend a lot of money on. How is it doing? You know, you want to be able to collect metrics, see like where a lot of its you know time is being spent, where resources are being used, um, and you might also want to assess the health of the machines that you have. So when somebody's like, "Hey, you know, my model went offline or my training has failed," you know, what's going on? You know, you can actually log in and see like, "Oh, is this node you know over flooded or is it you know down?" And so, the one thing that I will concede is that I think AI. You know, especially AI clusters have done really well is being accessible and being easy to deploy. Um, obviously, everyone's kind of had their own experience of Kubernetes and how they work with it. Um, but there's the big takeaway from this slide is that there is a multitude of tools that actually make it easy for you to quickly deploy your own systems and actually leverage the resources um, that you have. So, for example, kind of starting on stage right here, um, you have like OpenShift, you know, um, Charmed Kubernetes, which is a Kubernetes distribution um, maintained by Canonical. You know, you have uh, K3s, Rancher, Microcates, K0s, um, and then all the public cloud offerings, and Kubeflow, which is like entirely dedicated to running AI models and training them. So kind of the big takeaway here is that like there's so many tools, it's really easy to get started. You know, you just Google like, how do I deploy Kubernetes? How do I do AI? And you're gonna find all sorts of videos that help with that. And so effectively, you know, kind of where I'm starting to go here with this and telling the story is that what if we did the same for HPC? What if we made it really easy and accessible to get your hands on an HPC system that allows you to kind of take advantage of the same resources that you potentially use to like train your AI clusters, you know, run scientific simulations, CFD, all that good stuff. You know, what if we could do the same thing where it's really easy for people to get started? And so this here is where we say enter charmed HPC, you know, magic wand. And so kind of reading a bit of the tagline there um, at the bottom, Charmed HPC is a next generation open source cloud computing stack for supercomputers and high performance computing clusters. And so obviously we've workshopped that a bit and you know, added plenty of emojis to make it sound fun and exciting you know, with the rocket and the atom and all that. Um, but the idea is that you know, we kind of want to start closing the gap where it's like, oh, it's really easy to quickly bring up a Kubernetes cluster and just start doing the work that you want to do. We want to do the same thing. Make it really easy to bring up you know, a supercomputer so you can start doing your work. And so obviously, after reading the tagline, you might be like, cool, sounds interesting. So what is it? Well, to kind of look at it here, um, this is a big, you know, fun, complex graph per se, 
um, or chart of what it actually looks like. But the key thing that I want you to take away from here is that this is actually a common model um, of HPC cluster called the Beowulf model, um, or Beowulf, depending on how you say it. Um, but the idea is that you kind of have three core services that compose up your supercomputer. So first, you have kind of your workload manager and like resource manager. And so what that you know, application is responsible for is actually kind of scheduling, managing the tasks that you're running on the cluster, making sure it's working. The next part that you have is the identity and access management. And effectively, what that means is that you want to make sure that the people who are logging into your cluster and running workloads are who they say they are. And so for that, effectively what that is is that you know, HPC systems have a hard like a shell, soft and gushy on the inside kind of security model where effectively it's very hard to actually get inside. Um, but the idea is that once you're in, you, know, you kind of have full access to be able to do what you want. So you want to make sure that you know, before people actually start getting access to the resources, you know, they're fully authenticated and verified who they are. And the last thing is like having kind of some form of distributed storage slash parallel storage. And the idea of actually having those resources available is to make sure that wherever you end up in this big, you know, fun little picture here, um, your data will actually be there. So, you know, if you get put on partition A, your data will be there. If you get put on partition B, that data will be there too. And so now to kind of actually go through with what's happening in this picture here, so obviously it's very visually overloaded per se. So, you know, if you're um, digesting it, I'll walk you through it. Um, but effectively, you know, we'll kind of start on stage right here um, with the kind of how you would first get into the cluster. Um, so you usually have two possible options. The first is to actually go through in on the login node. Um, so effectively, that's just like a traditional jump host, you know, SSH in, and then from there, you know, kind of kick off the different tasks that you want to be able to run a newer project um, that's been kind of emerging as a way of like actually accessing and leveraging and using your uh, supercomputing resources is a project called Open On Demand, which is um, effectively a way of easily accessing your supercomputer resources over the internet. And so effectively then, after you log in, that's when you kind of start to come into contact with uh, different services that you'll have provisioned. Um, so for example, first, you'll have the job scheduler. Um, there's a lot of different job schedulers that you can actually use for HPC. Well, when I say a lot, there's like five big ones. Um, but the one that we're working with specifically is called Slurm. And so originally it was called a simple Linux utility resource manager. Um, but in recent years, they've kind of rebranded as the Slurm workload manager. And it's fun because sometimes if you run into the company behind it at events, they'll give you a shirt that says Slurm. It's not an acronym. Um, so they don't want you to use that. And then the second thing there is just kind of LDAP. So that's like lightweight directory access protocol. I think I remember that correctly. Um, but the idea is that there's like you have some kind of LDAP implementation that helps you kind of control users and groups. And then what you have there is your storage, which is, in our case, we're using Ceph. Um, specifically, Canonical has an entire Ceph team. Um, very great guys. Hopefully, if they watch this recording, they'll appreciate this shout out. Um, but they work with that. And then there's other file system protocols that we're kind of starting to work with. And so now, when we, you know, after we kind of get through the scheduler and LDAP and the storage here, um, what you'll see is the partitions on you know, the far left here or stage left. Um, and so what these partitions effectively are composed of is the actual you know, compute resources. And so this is where the workloads will run. So for example, you can have accelerators attached like GPUs. So you can actually use Slurm to schedule your jobs, um, to train your AI models. Um, you could also you know, just have basically CPU bound workloads. And so for example, uh, you know, just high performance hardware. And then the idea is that you have different you know, user level and drivers that'll be installed on those nodes. So for example, you'll have like InfiniBand, which is a protocol for high-speed networking. Um, you can have like a dedicated package management tool. So for example, Conda or SPAC. Um, and the idea is that like, oh, you just the, use these nodes to actually be the workers that run the tasks. And then Slurm is the one that's responsible for actually making sure that um, you know, you're using the resources that you've actually requested and you're not kind of escaping and messing with other people running workloads on the cluster. And so now then, when you actually start to look at the Click the little button here. There we go. Well, actually, no, it's too white. OK, there, it's fine. Um, but if you look at the top here, um, you'll kind of see some auxiliary services up top. So you'll see like Moz, Cause, and MySQL, which is like always fun because it's like, you know, we're tech. We love acronyms. Um, but effectively, um, to understand kind of working towards back here, me on the podium, um, first you have MySQL. Effectively, all that MySQL is good, does is it kind of logs your cluster usage metrics and all that, and accounting and whatnot. Um, so if you're like, hey, people are submitting jobs in my cluster, what are they doing? Um, that data will actually then be thrown in there. 
and then cause. Um, what that is is that it's called the canonical observability stack. Um, and effectively, it's just an application suite that's developed and maintained by um, Canonical for actually collecting and viewing cluster metrics. And the last thing is uh, Moz, which is the metal as a service. And so effectively what that is is that it's a way of us being able to actually request like all the hardware resources that is needed to deploy this whole cluster and put it on top of there. So, you know, using like say like boot, pixie boot images or use virtual machines, you know, we're able to actually deploy all the services that compose our cluster. And so now you might be looking at this and say, wow, you know, thanks Jason, you know, this graph is great, chart is amazing, you know, shows it how it all looks, you know, said and done, but how do we actually get there? You know, how do we actually successfully deploy this whole thing? So in this case, um, how we actually deploy and maintain and set up our clusters is by using a tool called Juju. Um, and effectively what it is, is it's a, you know, open source project that's sponsored by Canonical um, and it's, so I like to say it's a lifecycle management orchestrator. And so what it's for is effectively similar to say like Ansible or um, other tools like with Kubernetes like operator framework. Effectively what it's for is to help you kind of deploy, manage and sustain the applications that you're working with. And so the reason I kind of chose this chart here is that a common thing that I get when I talk about Juju is folks are like, well, it, that sounds great, but is it just like Ansible with extra steps? And I say, no, it's a little bit different, but I always kind of stumbled myself over the explanation. And so, you know, picture's worth a thousand words. So that's kind of the point here. Um, but effectively, what Juju is capable of doing is kind of being able to provide a lot of the core services that we need um, to successfully deploy our cluster. So for example, you know, node and machine setup, you know, like the really easy task, you know, kind of move over to installing, configuring, making sure everything's happy and works, integrate different applications together. Um, and then kind of going then to like the day two operations of being able to scale back up and monitor and observe, you know, the different services that you have deployed. And so now you've kind of looked at this, you know, and say like, oh, that's cool. You know, what, how does Juju work? You know, how does it actually, you know, kind of take this application that can do all this stuff like machine setup and how can it deliver and build the full cluster? So kind of the first part that you would start with um, when you're working with Juju is actually setting up the controller. And so what the controller effectively is responsible for is just, you know, interfacing directly with the clouds that you're working with. Um, so for example, Juju can work with all of the major public clouds like AWS, um, Google Compute Engine, Azure, and then it can also work with like kind of more private setups like OpenStack. And so the idea is that the controller is kind of that fundamental piece there that basically enables Juju to speak the language of that cloud. And so now with your controller, after you've set that up, um, you then move over to charms. So obviously Juju means, I uh, can't remember what language it's in, but Juju translates to magic. And then charms are effectively like, oh, you know, little things that help you, uh, you know, cast your magic. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, we use this building block called charms to be able to actually set up and kind of wrap the services we need to deploy to set up our supercomputer. So kind of starting here, um, you can kind of see on stage right here that we have the controller. And what the controller is responsible for is actually going ahead and communicating um, with the machine or VM, or actually in this case, the unit agent for how to basically say, hey, you know, you get an event, um, or I need some hardware resources, to set yourself up. And so after we start then, we kind of have this unit agent running in the background. And effectively what that's responsible for is, you know, kind of kicking off the charm and handling the execution of the charm. And so the main logic of the charm now lives in charm code, which is you know, typically written in Python. Um, Juju went through a few iterations there. Originally, it started with having a bunch of different shell script hooks, you know, similar to say like a snap package or Debian or post installation hooks, and kind of found as services get more complex, you know, shell starts to break down, and become very difficult to maintain. So instead, we moved towards Python. And then the charm code, effectively what it helps do and what it does is that it actually interfaces with different you know, um, service managers that can be running on the machine. And so in this case, the two common modes that we work with is first one, you know, systemd. Um, systemd is great for maintaining services and kicking them off and writing unit files and all that. Um, so charm code can interact with systemd. And then also um, we have snap in there as well, which snap kind of sits on top of system D so you can be able to actually run services in a sandbox environment. And so then here, what we then have is like the libraries. Um, and so effectively what charm libraries are um, is that they're you know, similar to packages for programming languages where you're able to effectively you know, kind of have repeatable logic. So for example, you could say like, 
this is how I want you to interface with apps. This is how I want you to interface with Snap. This is how I want you to interface with systemd. Um, and so they're really great for kind of creating reproducibility. And so now you might be saying, well, that's great. We have a charm. You know, we can deploy a service. You know, what's the next step? So here, this is where we start to integrate with other charms. And they start to communicate with each other and have fun conversations. Um, so in this case here, um, what you'll see at the bottom is the cloud substrate. So effectively, what that is um, is, OK, whatever cloud or location that you're actually deploying your charms to. And then you have the nice little fun gray box here, which represents the model. Um, and so effectively, that's Juju's way of saying, like, oh, this model is where all these charms live together. And then inside a model, you can have multiple charms deployed. Um, and so effectively, you know, the orange box represents the whole body of the charm. And then this part here with the like, gray boxes kind of represents the libraries. And then with the libraries, effectively what you can do with them is to actually help facilitate communication back and forth between the charms through integration. And so with the integrations, um, effectively what they allow is for charms to actually communicate back and forth with each other and store data. So, you know, for example, you could say like, hey, I'm deployed, you know, here's my access endpoint. And then another charm can integrate with that charm and retrieve that information. And so using the integration, um, they're able to actually set themselves up. And then you, know, you can integrate with different units. And then now you'll see this arrow actually coming out of the box here. So you're wondering, like, oh, what might that be? Well, now this is how you can have multiple models. And the idea of having multiple models is that you're able to actually deploy the core services of your cluster, but then also be able to support the auxiliary services as well. And so you might be saying, like, OK, what are offers? Well, effectively, offers are a way of models communicating back and forth with each other um, to actually enable their configuration and whatnot. So for example, you could have something that's deployed on Kubernetes. Um, and through offers, you know, you're able to actually communicate with your virtual machine cloud or public cloud configured um, system. And so now, once they come together to be one big happy family, you have to ask the question, does it work? And so now, looking at this. Uh, application here, you know, I've shown kind of all the boxes and charmed HPC, you know, some chart, short previews to actually see, does it work? And so first here, um, this is very short demo, um, but effectively this is demonstrating the capability of actually interfacing with the Slurm workload manager. So that's the bits there that are responsible for actually going ahead and scheduling the job. Um, and it's actually very simple. Um, you interface through the CLI. So it's like a very short video, but effectively you just type sbatch and then a shell script with your directives and whatnot, and I can go ahead and request your resources. Then the second part here, um, it's another short video. This is kind of demonstrating the file system functionality. Um, so this is actually a very small test that we have um, running CephFS um, to provide the distributed storage to our cluster. Um, and effectively what this video is demonstrating is us quickly deploying a Ceph cluster um, to set it up and then mounting some client units to um, actually mount the file system. So here, um, what you'll kind of see is the application on the stage left here. Um, deploying and setting itself up has a bunch of different status messages to kind of show how it's going, how it's doing. Um, and the idea is that you know, eventually, once everything and in the integrations and the events have communicated back and forth, um, they'll be able to actually you know, fully stabilize and show that the file system has been successfully mounted. So, um, while Ceph here is actually setting itself up, um, the CephFS um, unit is just kind of waiting like, hey, once this is ready, um, it'll go ahead and create the file system share and then actually mount it. So yeah, there's that video. And then the next thing is kind of showing the web front end. So in that big um, chart there, um, showing the cluster, um, basically effectively showing how to go ahead and integrate or actually access the front end to the cluster. Um, so what you'll see here is just a quick demonstration of us using the file manager to go ahead and open and edit a file. And so basically here, it's just like, it's alive. It actually works. You know, we were able to log in. And then the kind of next part here, observability. We didn't have a demo for this one because it requires a bit more resources to actually show up. Um, but this is kind of the start of the observability dashboard that we are working on. Um, so specifically for this, um, it's able to show statistics so it can show like, okay, jobs that were canceled, it can show jobs that were completed, um, and then it can also show like system metrics. So 
general overall usage. Um, it can also show like CPU usage, so like um, how many CPUs are currently sitting idle, how many CPUs are currently in use by different workloads, um, and then also like you can see the scrape info, um, which is useful for actually knowing if the um, system is working. And so you can also see like how much um, the scrape information is actually taking away from the performance of your cluster. And then the kind of last thing that you'll see on the side there, it's a little bit small just because of um, the screenshot being an ultra wide monitor, but um, the idea is that we also have alerts being able to set up. So for example, like if your cluster's oversubscribed, if you're starting to flood the system or your file system performance is starting to degrade, um, it can automatically actually send you alerts and then that way, you know, you can know it's like, oh, um, is my cluster working before users start submitting support tickets being like, hey, this isn't working, like what's up? And instead you can actually say, I know, um, we have to go reboot the file system. And then the last thing, most important thing um, that you know, folks are always uh, asking about is where's the documentation? And that's actually something we're also working on. Um, so this is just kind of a individual page here um, that's showing that us starting to build it out. Um, obviously working with the documentation, you know, it takes a bit of storming and forming first to figure out how you actually want to set up the system. And then the last bit that you want to do there is then actually build the documentation so other people can kind of access the knowledge in the cranium here. So now that I've kind of presented and shared a kind of few short videos there, I um, wanted to talk about a little bit of the future work that we have from here. So obviously we're very busy doing things. Um, and so effectively the bits that we've kind of actually gone ahead and finished that are at the bottom here, which is working with the different file system implementations. So the first ones that we're starting with is NFS and CephFS, uh, mostly just because we kind of already have the logic there. You know, we have the teams that we can work with um, and contribute to. And then pretty much everything else that we have is in flight as we kind of work to towards our alpha release. Um, so for example, one thing is that we're actually able to successfully deploy Slurm and get it working. Um, but you know, we also want to be able to enable high availability. So when we kind of scale up to actual production grade clusters, um, if Slurm has problems, you know, it's able to actually recover. Um, the other thing is that we want to do is flesh out our observability implementation. So if you saw on the screenshot, it was kind of light on details. Um, we obviously want to build out those details and build out those alerts. Um, the next thing that we're also working on is the enabling automatic detection of hardware resources. So obviously when you deploy a cluster, you know, you're not just taking the laptop that you have here or say a smartphone, but you know, millions of dollars worth of hardware. Um, and so one thing that we want to be able to actually provide people with is an easy way to go ahead and set up the necessary drivers for accessing those resources. Um, the other thing is actually building out the documentation. Um, so we do have some docs currently, but um, a lot of it's in my head. So we got to get it out of my head and make sure that what's in my head actually makes sense to other people. And then the last thing is actually, you know, fully integrating the open on demand interface. So we had a very early preview, um, but you know, there's a whole lot of crazy awesome things you can do with it, like creating you know, interactive apps, interactive desktops and whatnot, and we want to be able to make that a robust experience. And so yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, if you are interested in kind of the project and seeing uh, how we develop it and kind of see as we start to get towards an alpha, um, we do have this QR code here. We are an officially recognized um, community team as a part of Ubuntu, so a whole bunch of people from down the in around the industry um, are kind of working on actually developing um, Charmed HPC. And yeah, that's it. Any questions? Can, can you talk about a real world use case that you've seen or, or are preparing for? Yeah, so I think the big thing that we're preparing for um, is interesting use case where effectively it's a hybrid deployment of where we have both Kubernetes and a traditional HPC cluster. Um, so a lot of folks have been coming to us with basically saying like, hey, we have all these great resources um, like GPUs, so for example, like AMD or NVIDIA. Um, and the thing that they're kind of finding they want to do is be able to take intake large amounts of data, provide it to scientists, um, and then have them use these HPC systems to actually go ahead, schedule, and train um, on their resources. And then after that, what they want to be able to do is actually plug into Kubernetes um, and kind of host their you know, front-end infrastructure where they can actually publish and share their models and other folks can access them. But the big interesting thing that we're seeing is a lot of folks who want kind of that um, hybrid deployment where it's like Kubernetes is their front end that um, you know the public will interact with and then the HPC effectively provides the compute resources that they use for training. <laughs>
Why would you use the HPC over just using Kubernetes to do the training? So with the HPC system, um, one thing that helps with that is the workload schedulers. Typically, they're more um, designed towards um, affinity, so node affinity. So for example, traditional scientific computing workloads, um, they're very much built around the MPI protocol, um, which effectively you know, will stripe um, or split workloads across you know, a series of nodes and effectively use distributed memory to actually perform the work. Um, and so for those to actually be you know, good and performance you know, oriented, um, you need to actually take into affinity into account. So basically ensuring that like, oh, if I go into my data center, are all those nodes actually next to each other so that there's minimal latency between communication. Um, and so the reason why you know, someone would say, oh, why would I use an HPC instead of um, Kubernetes is just because like, a lot of the workload scheduler is kind of better suited to having that you know, fine-grained knowledge of the resources that it's scheduling workloads on. Um, that's why I'd say it is. Um, and then the other challenges is like with some Kubernetes-like schedulers, I know there's interesting projects like Volcano that is like looking at how we can kind of better position Kubernetes scheduling towards like AI workloads. Um, but typically like Kube scheduler, you know, something that a lot of like scientists have seen is that resources will just kind of get thrown randomly, which isn't great for workloads where, you know, you need kind of that node affinity to be there. Great questions. Thank you. <laughs> I can play it for you right now. <laughs>